Testing, testing. Testing, 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 testing. 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 All right, we're live. Welcome to another Hoopo stream. Today we're looking at uh, a paper called Scaling Vision Transformers to 22 billion parameters. So they finally did it. They finally took uh, Vision Transformers and then applied the uh, scale methodology to it. And I'm quite excited to see what we actually get out of it. Do we see emergent properties out of transformers? Do we see a step function and improvement? Do we see something that uh, we haven't seen before? So this is a relatively recent paper, 10 February, 2023. So just less than a week ago. And we got a lot of people here. This is a very large group of uh, researchers from Google research. I assume probably a bunch of these people aren't actually uh, researchy like phd type people a bunch of these people are probably more implementation software engineers cloud computing experts and so on because um the hard part about scaling vision transformers to 22 billion parameters isn't neural network architecture in theory it's really uh, the compute so organizing the data set organizing the compute and yeah it should be interesting to see how much money they use to train this um, at some point, they'll probably tell us the actual hardware specs, and then we'll be able to calculate exactly how much it costs to train this giant uh, VIT. So let's get to it. The scaling of transformers has driven breakthrough capabilities of language models. It's very true, right? The largest language models contain upwards of 100 billion parameters. And large language models, again, that's your GPT-3s, your GPT-4s. That's really what's uh, making waves right now in the tech industry at, at large, just because they're very, very good and they have these kind of emergent abilities, right? The, the performance of LLMs, whenever they scaled them up by a couple of orders of magnitude of 10, suddenly they became incredibly good at answering questions and, and understanding context and having a very broad general kind of knowledge base. And it's always kind of been an outstanding question of, okay, well, what happens if you do the same thing with vision transformers, right? Do we, do you get the same thing? Do you get the same result? And here we, we finally have this paper. So let's see. Vision transformers have introduced the same architecture to image and video modeling, but these have not yet been successfully scaled to nearly the same degree. The largest dense VIT contains 4 billion parameters. Okay. So this is kind of the the previous state of the art is about 4 billion, and then we would present a recipe for highly efficient straining of a 22 billion parameter VIT. Okay. So they, in this paper, they're going to go from 4 billion, which is the current state of the art, this Chen et al. 2022, this might be the meta paper, not 100% sure, but now they're going to basically 10x that to 22 billion. Perform a wide variety of experiments. They're gonna figure out whether it's useful or not. They evaluate on downstream tasks. Uh, they, so they uh, lightweight linear model on frozen features. So they basically uh, treat this kind of like a generic feature encoder where they're just going to train it on this giant data set. Then they're going to freeze it. Then they're going to cut off the head. Then they're going to put a new head for different tasks and then see how well it performs on those tasks. Uh, VIT 22B demonstrates increasing performance with scale. Okay, so that's good. At least we're the trend of more data, bigger model is still alive. We further observe other interesting benefits of scale, including an improved trade-off between fairness and performance. Okay. State-of-the-art alignment to human visual perception in terms of shape and texture bias and improved robustness. Okay. Uh, those are a little bit generic. So we, we have better performance, better robustness, and then it doesn't fall into the trap of texture bias, which is something that Covnets were very... Uh, susceptible to where basically the texture of the image basically largely determined the classification of the image 
demonstrates the potential for LLM-like scaling in vision. Okay, so this last sentence is a little bit discouraging because <laughs> demonstrating the potential is different than achieving that potential. So maybe they didn't quite get there and maybe we have to wait uh, another year or two for someone to train a 100 billion parameter VIT in order to see the emergent properties that we saw in large language models. Uh, similar to the natural language processing, transfer of pre-trained vision backbones has improved performance in a wide variety of vision tasks. Larger data sets, scalable architectures, and new training methods have accelerated this growth. Vision models have trailed far behind language models, which have demonstrated emerging capabilities at massive scales. Yeah, I mean, this is hard to a hard pill to swallow as a computer vision person, but I think part of that is that the modality of vision is just so much higher dimension than the modality of text. Text is reduced into basically something like, I don't know, like a hundred different possible letters and token, maybe not tokens, but you basically have letters and then you have words and everything is in this sequence order, right? So to me, natural language is a much easier problem than vision. So it makes sense that uh, vision is always going to be kind of a little bit behind because in a paradigm of deep learning in which we currently exist, currently exist, scale is everything, right? The bigger your model, the bigger your data set, the better your performance will be. So it makes sense that vision being higher dimensional will always kind of be lagging by a couple orders of magnitude compared to text, just because text is, uh, the data sets are bigger, the models can be bigger, and the actual input is smaller. And if you think vision models are behind or fall behind, just wait until you see video models, right? Because video models are to images what images are to text. It's a mere 4 billion parameters, the current state of the art. While a modestly parameterized model for an entry-level competitive language model typically contains over 10 billion parameters, and the largest dense language model has 540 billion parameters. Sparse models demonstrate the same trend where language models go beyond a trillion parameters, but the largest reported sparse vision models are only 15 billion. Yeah, so here a sparse model is a model that has been pruned, so not every single parameter inside the model architecture is active or non-zero. So that's what uh, dense versus sparse means. So in a sparse model, you might have a trillion parameters in the actual architecture, but of those trillion, only a small subset are actually non-zero. We can cover pathological training instabilities. Okay, so this is kind of the hard part about training these huge models where the gradients kind of disappear. The Sometimes you can't uh, get it to, to learn properly. And especially because you're using these, usually these kind of unsupervised training losses, it's, it's kind of difficult to really steer the model in a direction that you want. Carefully engineer the model to enable model parallel training at unprecedented efficiency. Okay, so they're doing some clever uh, parallel training. We'll see how that is done exactly. Uh, then they assess the quality on a suite of tasks ranging from few shot classification, so your standard kind of probably Coco ImageNet and dense output tasks that so we don't know what those are but even when used as a frozen visual feature extractor VITB achieves an accuracy of 89.5 on ImageNet and with a text tower trained to match these features it achieves 85.9 on ImageNet with a zero shot setting the model is furthermore a great teacher used as a distillation target we train VITB student that achieves 88.6, a state of the art on this scale. So what does a distillation target mean? So sometimes what you can do is you can take a big model and then you can use it 
to supervise the training of a small model. So that's what they mean here by teacher. So you can take a big model, you can put give or feed the big model an input and the big model will produce an output. And then you take a smaller model, a smaller neural network, and you say, okay, given the same input, you should create the same output. So basically the small model is just copying the big model. And this, this is called distillation, sometimes teacher-student training. And what they're saying here is that, hey, we train a 1 billion parameter model, which is, right, whatever, 5% of the actual final, of the size of the big one. And it was able to achieve 88.6 on ImageNet, which is actually quite close to the 89.5. So that's a, a good... Uh, good performance there. Performance comes with improved out of distribution behavior, reliability, uncertainty, estimation, and fairness trade-off. Previously unseen shape bias of 87%. So this is interesting. Maybe the closer or the, the more you scale these vision transformers, the more they become aligned with human perception and the less they become uh, susceptible to kind of the tricks of small comnets or the failings of small comnets. So that's interesting. The fact that human perception and then these very large vision models are both converging towards the same point. That could be something interesting. Effective query and key normalization on an 8 billion parameter model. Okay, so this is probably uh, keys and queries are basically two different tensors that are part of a uh, attention mechanism within a transformer model. So key and query normalization, my, my guess I hear is that it's something similar to batch normalization or layer normalization, which is a form of kind of regularization that you use to improve the training uh, st stability. So it seems like maybe what they're doing here is they're normalizing the queries and keys before they feed it into each attention head, and that will uh, result in a more stable training. So you see here the loss over the number of steps. If you do not have this query and key normalization, eventually the, the loss kind of goes up, which means you're overfitting. But it seems that with the normalization, you can continue to decrease the loss. You have the gradient of the L2 normalization. Okay, so you see here this kind of gets out of control. There seems to be this kind of one point here, right around two and a half thousand steps, where everything goes to shit if you don't have this query and key normalization. Log it max, attention max. Okay, interesting. Model architecture. So what is this? Did they just basically take uh, 7 trillion million attention heads and just put them one after the other? VIT22B is a transformer-based encoder model okay, that resembles the architecture of the original vision transformer, but incorporates the following three main modifications. So they have parallel layers. They have key and query normalization and omitted biases. Okay, so those are the kind of three bag of tricks that this huge crowd of people at Google Research were uh, centered on in order to train these very large vision transformers. As in Wang and Komatsuzaki, VITB, VIT22B applies the attention and MLP blocks in parallel instead of sequentially as in the standard transformer. Interesting. Okay. So what does that mean? So if we go to the original uh, tension is all you need paper. Go here. Right. These attention blocks are kind of stacked one on top of each other. I think there's a better image somewhere, right? Is there a better image? No, maybe not. No, there is not. Okay. But you have these kind of multi-head attentions, right? 
So this is the actual attention mechanism here, the, the just one of these little purple squares. Uh, you have your keys, your queries, and your values. So these are the major seeds that are coming in. And then the output is going to be, again, some keys, queries, and values, which will get fed into a different attention head. And the multi-head part here refers to the fact that there's kind of a depth to this, right? There's an additional dimension, which is the number of heads. So what they're saying here is that rather than have these heads kind of one after, or these attention blocks kind of one on top of the other, right? This sequentially. So you have a deeper model. They're basically going to do it in parallel, which means they're going to have it, instead of deeper, it's going to be wider. So the reason they're going to do this, right, this enables additional parallelization via combination from the NLP and attention block. So the reason they're doing this is because they're going to make the, uh, these, this model's going to be so big, it's not going to fit on a single TPU or a single GPU. So they're going to have to split it into a bunch of different TPUs and GPUs and train it in parallel, right? That's what model parallel training means. Sometimes what you do is the model can fit on a single GPU or a single TPU, and you do kind of data parallel training, which means that you're splitting the, the batch of data that you're, tra that you're training on, and you're splitting it across multiple computers that are all have the same model. But here in model parallel training, the model is too big to fit on any one compute node. So what you do is you cut the model into a bunch of different pieces, and then you feed um, the date of the batches through all those different pieces, and then aggregate at the very end. And in order to do that, your model needs to be able to be split into a bunch of different pieces that aren't don't require computation to flow between them. So that's why they decided to do uh, all these attention. Uh, blocks in parallel rather than in sequence as you would have it in a standard transformer. Um, but other than that, it's kind of pretty basic. You have a multi-layer perceptron. Ooh, accidentally. You have your multi-layer perceptron. You have your attention mechanism. So this is uh, here. Your multi-layer uh, MLP is this thing here. This thing that says linear, that's an MLP. This uh, scale dot product attention here, this purple brick, that's the attention. And then the layer norm, uh, it's not shown here, but you would basically have it either right before, right after here, or right here. So basically in between these, you're doing a layer norm. Okay, in particular, the matrix multiplication for query key value projections and the first linear layer of the MLP are fused into a single operation. And the same is done for the attention out projection and second linear layer of the MLP. Okay, so this is another trick here that you can do. So whenever you're training something on a GPU or a TPU, you have some code, which is usually written in a higher level language like Python, and then it gets compiled into a much lower level language, right, that the GPU can understand. And in the GPU's world, there's operations, right, which are basically tasks that it has to accomplish, right? And a, a matrix multiply might be an operation. An addition might be an operation, right? So these operations are kind of atomic units of work that a GPU and a TPU can do. So if you can figure out how to take different parts of your model that are right next to each other and rather than performing them as two separate operations fuse them into a single operation well you just made uh the amount of time it takes the gpu to calculate that much faster right because it only has to perform one operation rather than multiple operations so that's kind of what they're doing here is they're taking the matrix multiply of the key query and value projections right they're taking the matrix multiply that you're doing here and they're combining it with the MLP, which is here. So they're basically combining this purple brick with this gray brick here, so that they, and they make it one operation so that the GPU only has to do one operation to compute every, anything from here up to here. So again, we're seeing kind of these layers of different tricks that they're coming up with in order to be able to train this giant model for a very long time on a very big data set in a way that's efficient. And specifically, this technique of kind of fusing these uh, operations gives them a 15% speed boost.
So that's pretty fast. That's that's pretty good. In scaling BIT beyond prior works, we observed divergent training loss after a few thousand steps. In particular, this instability was observed for models with around 8 billion parameters. It was caused by extremely large values in the attention logits, which lead to almost one hot attention weights with near zero entropy. Okay, so what does what does this mean? So uh, if you have an attention matrix, right? So in an attention matrix, let me see if I can find a good picture for this. Maybe something like this with words so you can actually see the input. Okay, maybe something like this. Okay, so this is an attention matrix for a uh, text task. So if you have a, a text, right, it looks small outside, but it's quite big inside, nice styling too, right? So you have some sentence, and each of these words in the sentence, you can think of them as a token. Usually they're kind of cut into, words might be cut into multiple tokens, but for the purpose of this visualization, it doesn't matter. But you basically have this, every word in the sentence, and then every word in the sentence again, and then every word in the sentence pays attention to, or has the ability to pay attention to every other word in the sentence, right? So the the deep the darker this color is it, the more this word is paying attention to that word so this attention uh mask here or not mask this attention uh matrix is showing you roughly uh the dependence between the different words in this sentence right the the attention that they pay to each other so what they're talking about here is that the attention weights become almost one hots. What is that going to look like? What will it'll what it'll end up looking like is it'll end up looking a lot kind of like this. Like you'll have like for every word you'll only ever have one super bold uh number attention weight, and all the other ones will be zero, right? So rather than having an attention matrix that looks like this where you have a bunch of different types a bunch of different values you have zero look zero like values you have small values you have medium values you have uh large values it basically ends up into this uh, near zero entropy state where there's only ever one thing that each part is paying attention to right it's almost like a one hot right is the word that they use to describe it so that's what they mean by this kind of problem that they run into with the attention weights if they don't do uh, the the key query normalization that they're probably going to describe right here. Okay, we adopt the approach which applies layer norm to the qu queries and keys before the dot product attention. Okay, so that's basically what query and key normalization means. It's basically they're just doing a layer norm, but it's at the queries and keys, so right here. So you have keys here, you have queries, and you're gonna perform a layer norm right here before it gets fed into the attention head. Okay, so what does that actually look like? Right here, one over square root of D L N of X W Q. Okay, so you have a bunch of different terms here. Let's take out our green, which is our uh, highlight color for mathematical terms. We have D is the query key dimension. X is the input. That's what's actually coming in. LN stands for layer normalization. And WQ is the query weight matrix. And WK is the key weight matrix. Okay, so you have your input, right? Your input X here and your input X here. That is getting multiplied by the weights queries and the weights keys so you have your input which is coming in here and it's getting multiplied by the weights k which are the weights of this linear these linear layers here and the input here is coming in and getting multiplied by the wq and then after that happens then you apply the layer norm so now the layer norm is happening basically here in between this gray and this purple it's happening here right here and here And then they're putting it through a softmax. 
right, where a softmax, you haven't seen it before, but it's basically just uh, this. Right, so a softmax takes an input, which can be from negative infinity to infinity, and it makes it nicely shaped for you. So it'll usually squash it either between negative one and one, or uh, more commonly zero and one. So that you don't have really, really big values and really, really small values. All right, so that's that's the KQ normalization, which is basically just a type of layer normalization within the actual attention mechanism. All right, and we turns out we didn't even need to be alt tabbing into a different paper because we have the uh, actual uh, architecture diagram here. So. You have your inputs, you actually have a layer norm before those are turned into query key and values. Uh, you have the layer norms additionally for the queries and keys. Then you have your standard attention head. Uh, this is the, I think this is the fusing. So this like kind of like blue square here is to show you that uh, this part here gets fused. So this operation, and this operation are fused, so they get calculated at the same time uh, on the GPU or TPU in this case, since this Google. Encoder layer with parallel attention MLP blocks. Okay, and then you would have a bunch of these big blocks in parallel. The bias terms were removed from the KQV and all layer norms were applied without bias and centering. So traditionally in a neural network, you have a weight matrix and you also have a bias matrix. And more and more the bias part of the those two, right? You have the weights and the biases, but you more and more people are just getting rid of these biases because it turns out you don't really need them and then it saves you having to add, right? So a weight, matrix you have to multiply and then the bias you have to add so there's kind of a matrix multiply operation and then there's a add operation and the add operation for with these biases doesn't actually uh kind of help that much so this is something that i keep seeing over and over again is people just get rid of these bias terms and they just do it all with weights and here they give you the actual performance gain so they gain a three percent performance so maybe not as much as the as the uh, model parallel or the operator fusion that you the gain you gain from the operator fusion but three percent improvement still pretty good interestingly they do use bias terms for the mlp dense layers as we have observed improvement in quality okay so they actually do have biases here they just don't use them uh in this part the embedding linear projection and the additional position embedding follow those used in the original vit okay so position embedding is basically just an additional little number that you're giving the uh attention head that lets you know where in the sentence a specific token was. Uh, in the case of a vision transformer, it's uh, letting you know which, uh, where geographically in the image that image patch was taken from. Okay, this is... <laughs> This is crazy. VIT 22B uses a patch size of 14 by 14 with an image resolution of 224 by 224. That is tiny. 224 by 224 is like mobile net. You know, that is absolutely tiny resolution. And even the patch size of 14 by 14 is pretty small too. This is very unusual. I would have guessed that something with such a a 22 billion parameter vision transformer, they would have gone bigger with the resolution and bigger with the patch sizes. So kind of interesting that they decided to go so small with both of those. 
Similar to the original VIT, employs a learned one positional, 1D positional embedding, right? So when they cut the image into patches, uh, each patch is going to have an associated position embedding. During fine tuning on high resolution images, right? And you, if you have a different resolution, you're going to end up with different number of patches. So each visual tokens is another way of describing these patches, right? So you take these patches, and they're basically just a little vision transform transformer patches. Yeah, so this is what uh, patches look like in the context of vision transformers. I've shown this image a bunch of times now, but basically, right, you take your image, you cut it into these little patches, and then each of those little patches gets fed into the transformer as if it was a sentence, right? And the position embedding is basically, you could think of it like like a little extra piece of information that tells the neural, the, the neural net, the transformer, this patch is from the top left, this patch is from the bottom right, this patch is, so it's, that's basically what the position embedding is doing, is it's telling the, the network uh, what part of the image it's coming from, right? Perform 2D interpolation of the pre-trained position embeddings according to their location on the original image. Okay, so they have kind of uh, this interpolation which they can use to, if they have a different size image with a different number of patches, they can uh, uh, interpolate in this position embedding space such that kind of the relative position of the patch in the image is similar to the position embedding that you would get in the smaller resolution and smaller patch size that this model was trained on. Other hyperparameters are presented in Table 1, previously reported VIT models. Okay, so this is actually, gives you a little bit more of a sense of like, so this is the 22 billion parameters, so this is the total number of parameters, and compared to, for example, a VITG and a VITE, which are some other kind of generic uh, VIT, I guess the largest one. So this is the one that they keep referencing as the the 4 billion parameter. Or, yeah, so here you go, 3.9. So this was the previous largest vision transformer. So you can see the kind of order of magnitude there. Uh, the depth is actually smaller. So, right, because they wanted to do this model parallel training where you train all the, you can break up the model into a bunch of different little heads or different little transformer blocks and then train them all in parallel. They didn't actually want to go super deep with this model. So it makes sense that they actually reduced the depth and they just made it way wider. So you see here, look at the width of this, 6,000 compared to 1,000. Uh, the number of heads, way more, right? And you can see here, the multi the multi-layer perceptron which is just uh this part here right these little linear layers here's a multi-layer perceptron here's a multi-layer perceptron so they also kind of basically doubled the amount of that that there is in this well so really the main thing to take away from this uh table is that compared to previous state of the art really the the big difference is the width so the this new vit 22b is significantly wider than the previous uh largest vision transfer all right vit 22b is implemented in jax using the flax library so uh if you guys haven't heard of jax before it's basically the successor to tensorflow so TensorFlow is a deep learning uh, framework that was originally created by uh, Google and it became very popular. But over time, it actually lost popularity. It was a little bit confusing. Like there was too many ways to do things and people used PyTorch and uh, PyTorch became increasingly popular. But within Google, people kind of got tired of using TensorFlow and they created this new one called Jax, which is another deep learning framework. And Jax works very well for uh, taking a training pipeline and splitting it, right? Parallelizing it in intelligent ways, right? So if you are training on TPU pods, right? Like these kind of complicated uh, hardware systems that are like multiple 
devices in parallel and then you have some devices that have more gpus and less gpus right so like the reality of training these giant models is that you don't do it on a single gpu like you would do at home right you have these pods that each have different numbers of of tpus and then each of those tpus has a bunch of different uh there might even be different memory footprints although in this case they're all going to be the same tpu but Jax is very good at that. It's very good at taking your training pipeline and splitting it and parallelizing it onto hardware in a in a way that's kind of as as easy to understand as possible. So it makes sense that they did this in Jax. And not only are they actually doing model parallelism, but they're actually doing data parallelism. So they're splitting the batch over all the compute nodes and the model over all the compute nodes. Okay, so they use Jack XMAP, which provides explicit control over both the sharding of all intermediates as well as interchip communication. And this is a big one here. So, like in these large distributed training uh, or parallel training systems, like the communication between these chips is actually becoming incredibly important. And that's why you see, um, for example, in Tesla's dojo, the fact that all these chips are like very, very close to each other so that they can very quickly communicate especially if you're doing model parallelism right because in model parallelism you're splitting your model across multiple chips so if your model has any depth to it you need to let all the other chips know what the output of the other chips was right so it can get the communication overhead can get quite crazy very quickly we organize the chips into a 2d logical mesh of size tk T is the size of the data parallel axis. And then K is the size of the model axis. For each of the T groups, K devices get the same batch of images. Each device keeps only 1K of the activations and responsible for computing 1K of the output of all linear layers. Okay. So basically each individual little TPU within this uh, giant computational mesh, as sometimes people call it, compute mesh, is only calculating kind of a small part of this training uh, pipeline, right? It's only seeing a, a fraction of the individual batch, and it only has a fraction of the model. So you need this additional communication to kind of... Uh, share information across these little tpus because they only are used they're only seeing and uh, a fraction of the data and a fraction of the model you have here different devices these are so one uh common tpu pod is a tpu4 yeah so tpu v4 pods have four tpus on them and that's what you're seeing here so device one two three four so this is like one TPU four pod that has four TPUs on it. And then each TPU uh, X here can be an input, right? So it's only, it's computing a part of it, right? It's computing A is a part of the model and then X is a part of the input. And once it actually computes that, it needs to go and share that with the second device on this TPU pod, right? The second TPU. So you can see all the every single arrow here that goes in between one device and another device, that's overhead, right? That's communication overhead. So there's all this kind of like fancy stuff that you can do where you're kind of staggering the computations so that as soon as this device is done ca calculating this, it's exactly the point at which this device needs that information. So kind of they have these like these these staggered ways of kind of calculating and performing these operations in such a way that each individual device within this TPU v4 pod has uh, as little downtime as possible and any communication overhead is like happening during a computation so they call this asynchronized parallel linear operation Model parallel matrix multiplication with overlapping communication and computation across devices. So overlapping communication and computation, again, is that's, that's what we're saying there, where you don't want all of them to be synced, right? You don't want all of them to compute at the same time and then communicate at the same time, because then 
uh, you would basically just compute all four of the devices, all four of the little TPUs would compute, and then they would all just sit there, they would all wait for the communication to happen, and then they would compute again. And you would just be wasting a ton of time having them all do it at the same time, on the, at the same kind of, like, rate. It's better if you have them kind of staggered like this, where they're computing, uh, when one of them is uh, communicating, a different one is computing, when one of them is, the other one is communicating, then the other one is computing. So it's like, they're kind of staggering. Okay, asynchronous parallel linear operations. When we, as we use explicit sharding, we build a wrapper around the dense layers in Flax that adapts them to the setting where their inputs are split across K devices. Inputs are split across K devices, right? So each batch or each uh, input to the next layer, right? So this would be a, the input that you come into here your own, each individual TPU within this pod is only going to see a fraction of that input, right? It only has a fraction of the actual X. To maximize throughput, two aspects have to be considered, computation and communication. Namely, we want the operations to be analytically equivalent to the uncharted case and to communicate as little as possible. So analytically un equi equivalent to the uncharted case, what this means is that they want to be able to split this across a bunch of uh, TPUs and a bunch of machines, but they don't want that to change the value of the actual computation, right? So they want to design this uh, model parallel and data parallel training in such a way that it's actually ending up in the same place as if you had one giant theoretical GPU that could calculate all of this on the same machine. So they don't want to change the answer by having it sharded, right? Or uh, split across multiple machines. Communicate as little as possible, right? So communicating between chips is actually usually much slower than performing an operation. And more and more in these kind of large uh, training, parent, like when you're training these huge models, it's actually the communication that acts as the bottleneck, not actually the matrix multiplies or the operations that are happening. And ideally to have them overlap so that we can keep the matrix multiply unit where most of the flop capacity is busy at all times. Yeah, so then this uh, staggering, I call it staggering, but that's not actually the word. That's someone who's like, someone who does this, like an engineer who's like specifically good at this type of stuff. They wouldn't call it staggering, but it's this idea of like having them uh, perform the operations and do the uh, communication in such a way that as soon as the operation is done, the the communication is basically just finished so that you can start again on the operation, right? Because you want the matrix multiply unit, which is kind of the, the, the core part of the, of the TPU, right? The core part of the GPU. The reason you're using a GPU and a TPU is because it's very fast at doing a matrix multiply. So you want it to be doing matrix multiplies all the time. You don't want it to be doing one matrix multiply and then spend and sit there and sit for four seconds while it gets the next thing to matrix multiply. You want it to be constantly matrix multiplying is. Okay. So to illustrate the process, consider the problem of computing y equals ax under the constraint that the ith block of the x and y both reside on the ith device. Okay, so here they're basically just gonna Describe to you exactly how this is happening. So you're computing y equals ax. So this is just a matrix multiply. You have some input x, and it's, you're multiplying it by some matrix A, and you want to get uh, some output y. So you're, you want to compute a matrix multiply. And then you have uh, i devices. So you have i total TPUs, right? So the dimensionality of the weights is m by n. And then a i j is uh, divided by k. So each machine only has one portion of the total weights, right? So the total weight matrix A, even though it's m by n, this machine here, device number four, only has uh, a34, which is a subset, right? It's a small chunk of the total weight matrix. And it's only ever seeing a small chunk of the input 
and it only has to calculate a small chunk of the output, right? So it's basically, you're just doing a little part of that calculation on one machine. First option is to have device I hold the ith block of rows necessary for computation yi, so that to compute yi, the chips needs to communicate k minus one times to complete x a total of k minus one and by k floats. Okay, so it's a little bit needlessly verbose, but you don't need to necessarily super know what's going on here, right? It's basically just, I think that the high level explanations that we got here are more than fine. This is just kind of going into the details of how the numbers work out. Uh, the device I can hold the ith block of columns. This way the device computes the vectors, which have to be communicated, scatter reduced. Okay, that's the actual uh, communication uh, operation. I don't know if operation is the right name, but it's basically, that's what's actually happening. You're, you're doing a reduce operation with the other devices. Note that here, the communicated vectors belong to the output space. This asymmetry is leveraged in communication costs when n is not equal to m. Column sharding is used in the computation of the output of the MLP in a transformer where n equals 4m and a row sharding elsewhere. Okay, so column sharding versus row sharding. So if you remember uh, the attention matrix, right? So it turns out they use the same letter, which is convenient for us, but you're performing some matrix multiply, right? And this matrix has some dimensionality m by n, right? It has some width and some height, right? So here's a better one, right? There's some width and height to this a. So if the attention matrix has uh, is much wider than it is taller, then you're going to want to use, for example, column sharding versus row sharding. I'm, I'm not exactly sure which which way that would work out, but basically depending on the on the size and or not the size, but the shape of that attention matrix or specifically here just a generic matrix A, you're going to do a different type of sharding. So you see here they have a TPU V4 pod which has four TPUs. Is it is this a four TPUs or is the V4 just refer to version four? How many pods or how many TPUs in one TPU pod? A single TPU pod consists of 4,000 of these chips. What? So they have four TPU V4 pods? Is that what's going on here? Hmm. Either way, there's some amount of TPU chips and the model does not fit on any one of those GPU, TPU chips. So they have to split it up. And that's what's happening. And depending on the number of, of chips that you have and the size of the matrices that you're trying to split up, it's either gonna be more efficient to column shard or row shard, right? which you could think of as kind of data parallelism or model parallelism. Are you sharding the, the, the input and the, and the, so the X, or are you sharding the model, the capital A? And here you go. Matrix multiplications are overlapped with the communication of the neighbors. This asynchronous approach allows for high matrix core utilization and increased device efficiency while minimizing waiting on incoming communication. This is huge. That's like, that's where it's all at is reducing the amount of time you wait for IO input and output. Presents the overlapping communication and computation across four devices with parallel linear operation in row sharding and column sharding modes. Okay, parameter sharding. The model is data parallel on the first axis. Each parameter can be either fully replicated over this axis or have each device hold a chunk of it. We opt to shard some large tensors from the model parameters to be able to fit larger models and batch sizes. Yeah, so 
once you decide that you're going to be training this uh, across multiple devices, such as they have, then you're no longer limited to the uh, memory of your GPU or TPU, right? Like if I want to train something on my computer here at home, I can't design a model that's bigger than the GPU. And I can't train it on a batch size that's bigger than the GPU, right? Both my model and the batch both have to fit at the same time on my GPU. But when you're doing these kind of uh, parallelized setups, you don't, have, you don't have that constraint anymore, right? Now you can fit something that's much bigger and you can use much bigger batch sizes. So uh, the batch size, you almost wanna make that as, as big as possible. Right, because the bigger the batch size, generally the more stable the training. It's kind of like uh, decreasing the learning rate is kind of what you're doing there. But yeah, so they're going to basically have a huge batch size probably. Uh, in particular, while computing one layer, the device can start communicating the weights of the next one, thus minimizing the compute overhead. VIT processes 1.15k tokens per second during training on a TPU v4, so probably a TPU v4 pod. Model flops utilization 54. So even with all this uh, kind of clever communication stuff where you're basically communicating while you're computing 54 percent so the 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 matrix the oper the the tpu is only actually calculating 54 percent of the time which is pretty crazy to think about and this is considered very efficient so it just goes to show you how poor uh or how much communication overhead is kind of slowing down our training right now BIT22B is trained on a version of JFT. Okay, so this is uh, some kind of image data set here. Extended to around 4 billion images. These images have been semi-automatically annotated with a class hierarchy of 30 labels. We flatten the hierarchical label structure and use all the assigned labels in a multi-label classification fashion, employing the sig point cross entropy loss. Okay, this is actually kind of kind of lame. I thought they were going to be doing something a little bit more interesting. I thought that they would use some kind of unsupervised uh, loss, right? Some kind of mask-based loss. But it actually looks like what they're doing is they're taking a very big data set. They're uh, creating kind of these pseudo-labels. So 30K total possible classifications. And then they're basically training this like a giant classification model where there's uh, 30,000 possible uh, classes. And then they're just training this with a cross entropy loss. So this is quite lame. This is basically they're training it like a juiced up ImageNet model. I feel like they could have done a unsupervised objective and, and gotten way more out of it maybe they're just waiting and they'll they're going to do that and then publish that later it seems weird to me that they would do this this seems like a too simple too simple of a data set too simple of a training style vit 22b was trained using 256 visual tokens per image right the 14 by 14 is that does the math work out there no it does not each token represents a 14 by 14, pa okay, each patch is 14 by 14 pixels, but 224 divided by 14 is 16, and then 16 times 16 is 256, okay. So that's where the 256 is coming from. It's 16 patches by 16 patches, where each patch is 14 pixels by 14 pixels. So, each image is roughly a 256 long sentence of visual tokens. Train for 177K steps with a batch size of 65K or approximately three epochs. That's also quite small. 
with only seeing each uh, image in the data set three times. Damn, this is kind of lame. Like they're training it with a uh, classification loss for three epochs with a 224 by 224 sized image. Like, come on, like, what is that? <laughs> That's, this should have been twice as big images, trained for 10 times as more epochs and trained on a unsupervised, some kind of mask based loss. All right, all right, so they have your standard kind of learning rate scheduling here where you have a linear warm-up period and then you have a cool down. So uh, different normalizations, specifically like layer norm or batch norm or even just your optimizers like Atom, they have these momentum terms. So you don't want to just start pushing gradients right off the bat. You want to basically start warming up where you're feeding in batches of data and, and letting the momentum terms of these different regularizations or different uh, optimizers kind of warm up, right? So that you're letting those internal parameters for those optimizers get to a point where they're a little bit more stable. And then once they are stable enough, which is, I guess, the first 10K steps, then you can start actually pushing gradients. So that's what the warm up period is. And then they have this cool down period. So in the cool down period, similar to kind of in a learning rate, uh, the reason you're doing learning rate scheduling is because initially you want a bigger learning rate to, to kind of move that marble faster through the high dimensional landscape. And then once it starts settling into a little global minima or local minima, you want to reduce the learning rate so that it kind of becomes more and it finds the, like the lowest part of that, right? in a similar way you want to basically cool down the parameters of your optimizers these internal momentum parameters as well so the very last 30k steps you're going to be using a much smaller learning rate and you're going to have kind of this uh the result of the cool down on the uh things like the 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 momentum inside your optimizer for better few shot adaptation, we use a higher weight decay on the head. Okay, so weight decay basically just means that you have this additional regularization where the weights, uh, which are the different parameters inside your transformer, they they decay over time as well. But these are these aren't like new; these are just kind of like standard training tricks. Transfer to image classification. Efficient transfer learning with large scale backbones is often achieved by using them as a frozen feature extractors. Yeah, this is kind of what computer vision over the past 10 years has been, is basically taking these frozen feature extractors and then fine-tuning it to your task-specific problem. So, in a way, what they're showing you here is kind of how people would use a VIT-22B in production in the real world. Uh, evaluation, locked image tuning, as well as out-of-distribution transfer. Addition results for head to toe transfer, a few shot transfer, and linear probing can be found. Locked image tuning. This is a, there was a paper that we read on this channel where it described this, but that's basically locked refers to the idea of uh, freezing the uh, lowest layers, right? So basically the feature encoder or the feature extractor, you freeze those so you're, you don't allow gradients to push down for your ta your specific task. We explored various ways of training a linear probe. Our final setup on ImageNet uses SGD with momentum for 10 epochs at 22 pixel resolution using mild random cropping and horizontal flipping. So they do a little bit of data augmentation, but that's really the only one. There's still a notable improvement at this scale. Linear probing of large models can approach or exceed performance of fine tuning, full fine tuning of smaller models with high resolution. Okay, so here you have different models. This is theirs, right? The 22B. And then you have uh, different performances here. So, I mean, it does seem like the 
Vision Transformer that they train here is kind of the best across the board. E14 is the, uh, this is the one that they compared to here. This is the four billion parameter vision transformer that was the from this Chen et al 2022 paper that was before this paper the largest vision transformer so interesting that they weren't not able to beat the E14 model which is a 4 billion parameter vision transformer even these numbers aren't like necessarily huge right it's like you're kind of like barely beating the performance of the 4 billion parameter vision transformer model. High res fine tuning. So high res here refers to the image resolution and then fine tuning means you're uh, training the model in such a way that your uh, gradients go all the way through the model. So here you have your uh, frozen. So you're only training the head and then here you actually are pushing the gradients all the way through. We further test linear separability on the fine grain classification data set. So here's another little benchmark, iNaturalist 2014 or 2017, which has 5,000 categories. Unlike ImageNet, the image Numbers in different categories are not balanced. The long tail distribution of concepts is more challenging. So it's basically like a hard image net. Uh, similar to linear probing, we use SGD with this as a learning rate and no weight decay. So that is, this is pretty, pretty vanilla. That's kind of like the most basic form of gradient descent that you could do. Train for 30 epochs. Uh, figure four, we observe that VIT-22B significantly improves over other VIT variants. This suggests that a large number of parameters are useful for extracting detailed information. I mean, this is kind of understatement, right? At the end of the day, the bigger the model, the better, like pretty much every time. Linear probing. So this is a higher resolution image. This is a lower resolution image. This is the four billion parameter Transformer, this is the 22 billion parameter transformer. And I guess what they're showing you here is that significant accuracy improvement. I don't know about significant, but there is that, there is some there, right? You have roughly kind of like a 2% improvement over the 4 billion parameter model. And then here you have kind of a 1% improvement over the 4 billion parameter model. I think it's a little lame, you know? They were probably expecting much more here, right? They would have preferred something like this, right? Like how much cooler would it have been if they got like a 20% jump like you saw here? But I would say that they there's so much more that they could have done, right? I, I still think that the, the way they train this and the size of the images and the duration of the training was a little bit just not ambitious enough. I think they should. They could have gone bigger in all of those. Uh, zero shot transfer. So zero shot basically means they don't uh, they don't fine tune on ImageNet. They're just they just take their model as is, and then they see okay, well, how good can this perform? Pretty much as is. Zero shot, right? Zero zero shot basically means first time on ImageNet, and you can see that it's. It's good. I mean, it's not like amazing though. Right? Like it's pretty much on par with these other ones here. Okay. Following the locked image tuning, which is lit, you guys should definitely go check out that video. It's on the channel. We train a text tower contrastively to match the embeddings produced by the frozen VIT-22B model. With this text tower, we can easily perform zero-shot classification and zero-shot retrieval tasks. We train a text transformer with the same size on the English subset uh, for 1 million steps with a 32K batch size. That's a huge batch size. These images are resized to 288. And the text is tokenized using sentence piece. 
Okay. So in locked image tuning, they uh they basically the text tower here refers to a language model, right? The same way that you can have a feature encoder for images, you can have a feature encoder for text, right? And you're using the the text feature encoder to basically create uh classification labels which are you are then using to train the vision model so it's basically what the, what this paper showed here was they were they were doing all kinds of tricky stuff with like you freeze the the text encoder you freeze the image encoder and you're kind of push it using pushing them back and forth so it's like it's kind of like let's see locked image tuning do they have the image Yeah, there's figure is worth a thousand words. Yeah, so here you go. Design choices for contrastive tuning on image text data. Two letters are introduced. Okay, so here you have locked, pre-trained, unlocked, pre-trained, and unlocked from scratch. So you are either locking or unlocking the image and text model. And then U stands for unlocked and initialized. U stands for unlocked and randomly initialized. LU is named locked image tuning. So locked image tuning specifically is this one here, where the image model is locked, and U is unlocked and randomly initialized. So then the text model is unlocked. So locked image tuning specifically is this here. Okay, table she table three shows zero shot transfer. You compare it to a bunch of other models. VIT twenty two B achieves either comparable or better results. Okay, pretty standard stuff. Okay, we construct a label map. From JFT, so JFT is the data set that they trained on. We should, what the fuck actually is JFT data set? JFT 300 mil is an internal Google data set used for training image classification models. Images are trained using algorithm, okay. Well, there you go. So you're never going to use this unless you work at Google. So JIT, JFT 3 bill is an even an even larger internal data set which consists of 3 billion images. And that's kind of the sad part is I think that as we move into a future where uh, these big foundational models are more and more financially useful, right? So like a company like Google, previously like the deep learning models that it was producing, it was not really necessarily driving a huge amount of the performance and, and business uh, of Google the company, but now more and more these large models are the the main source of money and main source of, of revenue for the business. So you're going to see companies be more and more protective of their data sets that they're using to train these large foundational models. And this type of stuff here, right, JFT, 3B, right? You're never going to see that unless you work at Google because they're never going to release that. And uh, Meta is going to have their own version of this giant image data set. Microsoft is going to have their own version of a giant image data set. And unfortunately for companies like Stability.ai, they're going to kind of get fucked because they don't have large data sets. They don't have large... I don't even know what they're going to do. I think they're just going to try to train on images that are publicly available. But even nowadays, you, we're, they're running into issues where they trained on Getty Images and now Getty Images is suing them, right? They, they trained on um, some kind of like art website and then, then the art website is, is suing them. So people are getting very defensive and very protective about their data sets, which is not great for the machine learning community, but... Hey, you know, what What are you going to do about it? Okay, so they have some variations of ImageNet here. 
These are all different classification. You have object net, 800, 313 categories, image net, 200 categories. Uh, out of distribution classification performance. So object net accuracy, image net accuracy. So this is accuracy on two different data sets. So you would expect that a model that is crap on both data sets, and, a, and then you have a model here that is good on both data sets. So this is the, the generic, this is like I think the first vision transformer, this one here, B16, I think that's what that means. And then 22B is the one that they're presenting in this paper. And then this E14 is the 4 billion one. So you can see how this 22 billion transformer is really just the continuation of this trend line. This is kind of interesting here, though, the fact that this is like, it's almost more of an exponential here. Confirm the results that scaling the model increases the out of distribution performance. So out of distribution performance is another way of saying kind of robustness or generalizability. So like the ability of your model to generalize outside of the training distribution that it was trained on. How well does it perform on data that it hasn't seen, right? Data that it hasn't seen is another way of saying out of distribution. So if your model performs better out of distribution, what they're basically saying is that the model performs better on data that it hasn't seen before, or data that's kind of very different in some way to the data that it was trained on. Continues the trend of better OOD performance with larger models. Fine tuning boosts accuracy and out of distribution, the effective robustness decreases. We see a significant increase on object net. Transfer to dense prediction. Transfer learning for dense prediction is critical, especially since obtaining pixel level labels can be costly. In this section, we investigate the quality of captured geometric and spatial information on semantic segmentation and monocular depth estimation tasks. So all this, all the kind of stuff that we saw up to here, this was all uh, classification, right? So these are all different classification tasks, which is basically, here's an image, and then give me a one hot vector that is whatever, 313 long, that contains the probability of this image belonging to one of 313 different categories. And all classification tasks are like that. But that type of prediction is different from what they call here dense prediction, right? So there's, there's other types of tasks that are kind of a little, bit, a little bit fundamentally different than classification. And one of those is, for example, monocular depth and semantic segmentation, because for monocular depth and semantic segmentation, you're not just outputting a, a kind of classification vector, right? Which is just this one dimensional classification vector or not one dimensional, but like it's one by 313, right? Now, when you're doing a monocular depth estimation, what you're, you're actually outputting a depth map, right? You're outputting a full image, semantic segmentation. You're outputting a mask, an actual like pixel mask. Monocular here just refers to given a camera image, give me the depth image, but I don't, I, usually when you're giving a, getting a depth image, you have multiple cameras, right? You're doing kind of uh, a stereo camera or something, but monocular depth estimation is getting depth from just a single RGB image. So uh, dense prediction here uh, is just referring to the fact that in these type of tasks, the output is denser, right? Higher dimensional, more intense. Where to end to end tuning versus a frozen backbone. The number of additional parameters is negligible compared to the size of the backbone. Okay, so here you go. This is actually, I should have just cut to this, but here you have an image, a monocular, right? One camera, one image, and then this is the depth. So depth is basically for every pixel in this image, the model is calculating how far away is this pixel from the camera. So you can see here that it correctly gets that this part of the image is further away from the camera than this part of the image. You shot semantic segmentation. So in semantic segmentation, you have some image, which we don't actually see here, but every part of that image is belongs to a different category, right? So for every single pixel in this image, 
it's almost like doing a classification problem for each pixel, right? Each pixel can only belong to one of these classes, right? Maybe this is bridge, building, mountain, sky, trees, or something like that. So this is the ground truth. This is what the actual labels for this image are, and this is what the uh, one-shot semantic segmentation gives you, which is actually quite close. And I think the interesting uh, thing to see here is this the bridge, right? You would have thought that and maybe the reflection of the bridge would have caught or something like that, but the fact that it gets it is quite nice. Okay, the performance is kind of on par with the previous ones. We use the linear decoder from table four. We observe that our VI-22B backbone transfers better when seeing only few segmentation masks. Monocular depth estimation. Uh, they mirror the setup and train their dense prediction transformer on top of a frozen VIT22 backbone. Obtained from the Waymo Open Real World driving data set. I bet you that one's not even public either. Or maybe it is, maybe Waymo Open. Let's see, Waymo Open Real World driving data set. Waymo Open Real World driving data set. Ah, okay, so this is open. So the Waymo open data set is uh, open. Uh, how big is this one? I wanna give you my data. Perception. All right, they want to know who I am, but I'm not going to tell them. Okay, here we use only a single feature map. Uh, explore a much simpler linear decoder. In both cases, we predict log plus of one plus depth. Okay, use mean squared error as the decoder training loss. Again, so like this is not a classification problem, right? These dense prediction problems the losses are different. It's not a cross entropy loss, it's a mean squared error loss. And here this arrow means that lower is better. So 0.39 compared to 0.53. This actually does seem like a pretty good one. Right, this is kind of a significant jump here. These findings demonstrate that both the greater model size and the greater data set size contribute substantially to the improved performance. Yeah, these seem almost like the best ones we've seen in this paper. I think some of the other, the classification tasks, it, like the performance improvement was like rather negligible, but here it does seem kind of pretty good. All right, transfer to video classification. Okay, so Another thing they're going to evaluate this on is uh, video classification. We follow the factorized encoder architecture. Our video model consists of an initial spatial transformer, which encodes each frame of the video independently of each other. Okay, so basically every frame in the video is turned into a, or is fed through the, the transformer independently. And then the representation from each frame is pulled into a single token. That models the temporal relations. Okay, so they have two different transformers here. They have one that's operating at the image level, right, the frame. And then they have a different transformer that's operating at the temporal level, right? So if you if each frame is fed into this vision transformer and it produces kind of some output, some vector, right, some token, which they, they call here the frame token. And then they have another transformer that's looking at all of these frame tokens for the video. Yeah, and the, the one that looks at all the frame tokens, that would almost be better, 
that one's gonna be hard. I don't know what they're gonna use if for that, but the one that goes from the image, each individual frame, into some kind of frame token, you that's where they're just gonna use their pre-trained model. The VIT22B. Experimental details, temporal transformers, lightweight. Okay, so, and then the temporal one, I, I, it seems like they just kind of train it from scratch. Which makes sense. I don't know what you would fine-tune this on. Or what you would pre-train a temporal transformer on. Maybe they could do that. Maybe Google can take YouTube. They can take every every video on YouTube. They can turn it into frames, feed every single frame through this VIT22B, uh, and then create a bunch of uh, frame tokens, and then pre-train a giant temporal transformer on next frame token prediction. How crazy would that be, right? I think that's enough. They have enough data to do that. So there you go. There's the next research direction. Next frame token prediction using YouTube as a data set. Table 6 presents our results on video classification on Kinetics 400. This is a data set. And moments in time, another data set. Our larger model improves by 1.5 points. Okay. Performs a combination of contrastive and generative caption pre-training in comparison to our supervised pre-training. And uses many tokens per frame. Yeah. The supervised pre-training still just feels so bad. I don't know why they did that. There is headroom for further improvement by full end-to-end -end fine tuning. This is evidenced by current state-of-the-art on Kinetics 400 and Moments and Times, which leverage a combination of large-scale video pre-training and full end-to-end -end fine-tuning. So these are two different vision tasks, and this is the 4 billion parameter model, this is the 22 billion parameter model. So, I mean, it's a little bit of a jump, but not really huge. Beyond accuracy on downstream tasks. When studying the impact of scaling, there are important aspects to consider beyond downstream tasks. We probe VIT22B's fairness, alignment with human perception, robustness, reliability, and calibration. Okay, so they do a little bit of kind of qualitative analysis here. Okay, so this fairness stuff is like a little bit racist, I know, sometimes. Like, you know, they're they're taking like this data set and then like they have gender and, and race and then they're basically like doing these like experiments where they're like, is the model uh associating certain terms with certain races and certain genders? And then if it isn't then they consider it fair. But, I don't know, I feel like the experiment of doing this is kind of racist, you know? <laughs> like, I don't know. Okay, so, blah, blah, blah. It's not, the model's not racist. And it's not whatever the racist equivalent of gender is. But, Okay, it seems to be doing fine. Like, look at here. Uh, association of attractive and smiling to male versus female. And I guess you want these to be as close to each other as possible. So this is the large one, and these are closer than the small one? I don't know, it seems like about the same. I don't know. Okay, human alignment. How well do VIT22B classification decisions align with human classification decisions? Using model versus human toolbox, we evaluate three, fine tune our image net. Uh, closest alignment with human classification accuracies. So this is kind of interesting. So when you have these uh, classification 
data sets, right? At some point, the people who made that uh, benchmark paid for some humans to actually do that, right? So they've actually had humans go through and do ImageNet, right? They actually, the, the, some guy sat down and he tried to classify the test data set of ImageNet. So not only can you get uh, the performance of your model on ImageNet, but you can also say, well, how close was the performance of my model to the human, right? Like the things that the human got right and the things that the human got wrong did my model get the same kind of things right and the same kind of things wrong? And this is what they're calling kind of alignment. So like, are the mistakes and the that the VIT22B model does, are they similar to human mistakes or are they kind of random mistakes that are different? See, most human-like error patterns. And what they're noting here is that the VIT22B model has the highest ever recorded shape bias while most models have a strong texture bias. So the interesting thing that they're noting here is that the VIT22B model is more human-like than any other previous model. So if you looked at other previous models, they were wrong and, and they were right sometimes, but the ways that they were wrong and the ways that they were right were not like humans. Humans are wrong in different ways and right in different ways. But it, this VIT22B model is more similar to the human in terms of what they get wrong and what they get right. Which is kind of creepy to think about. Like, what exactly, like... Right? Our, vis our, our AIs are becoming more human-like as we make them bigger and bigger and bigger. So yeah, here you go. Look at this thing. Humans. So here, on the very end here... You can see how humans are extremely shape biased. Humans are classifying things almost entirely based on the shape, which basically means like the outline of an object. Uh, versus something like AlexNet, right? The very first ConvNets, they're very shape or texture biased, which means that they're basically just looking at the texture of something and then classifying it based on that. So. It's kind of cool how VIT22B, right, the large vision transformer, has the same shape bias that humans does, right? It doesn't have the class, it doesn't have the texture bias of these convnets, right? It has the shape bias of humans. And even just in general, all of these here, these are all uh, convnets, and you can see how all the convnets have the same texture bias. They all tend to be wrong and write in the same ways. But these all here, all these ones with color, these are all transformers. And you can see how the transformers, they don't have that type of texture bias. They have this shape bias. That's kind of cool. Okay, we evaluate not only with the accuracy, but also uncertainty metrics. Okay, they have a couple different data sets here. Okay, you see accuracy area under the ROC curve area under the PRC curve calibration along with the robustness it is also natural to wonder how the calibration property of VIT evolves as the scale increases we consider VIT 22B fine-tune on ImageNet and report the error versus the calibration VIT22B remarkably intrudes the trade-off between accuracy and calibration. Temperature scaling of the logits. Okay, so what are they showing here? Pareto Frontier. So Pareto Optimality and kind of what they're referring to here versus the accuracy versus calibration is uh, when you're doing computer vision uh, classification or detection tasks, there's a trade-off between like, if your model has everything with a very high confidence, it'll tend to predict, over-predict things, but sometimes that's fine, right? Sometimes you, you'd rather have like kind of a jumpy detector that like detects things that aren't necessarily there, but is almost guaranteed to detect it as soon as something is there. 
but other times you're i don't know maybe you're doing some kind of cancer detection and you don't want it to be very jumpy you want it to like only ever give you a positive when it's undoubtedly a positive so there's these kind of trade-offs here right and here they're talking about uh accuracy and calibration and I guess what they're showing here is that the VIT-22B is on the lowest and leftmost corner, so it has the lowest image net error, and it has the lowest accuracy versus calibration, which is here ECE. So something here, like a clip or an Alex net, has a high image net error and then a low ECE. And then ResNext and SimClear have low image net errors but high ECE. Unscaled, temperature scaled. Okay, I don't know. TLDR, it doesn't actually fucking matter because you're going to be using this blue dot. Right, so like who cares about these ones because these are ancient history at this point, right? Like who is using AlexNet? No one is using AlexNet anymore. Everybody's using VIT22B. But not actually because I don't think they're gonna release this. <laughs> okay, we perform model distillation to compress VIT22B into smaller, more widely usable VITs. So they distill it, which again is kind of this uh uh, teacher student paradigm where you basically are training a smaller model to copy the big model so in this case they have these two small models and they basically are training them to copy the big model uh, mix up transforms minimize the KL divergence between the student and the teacher distribution so KL divergence is a loss that people use to bring uh, two distributions together. So KL divergence. So uh, you have some distribution, right? Let's say here you have this, this orange distribution and then you have this uh, blue distribution, right? And you want to know how similar these distributions are to each other. So a KL divergence basically tells you that these distributions are more similar or less similar, right? So it's just kind of like a, this is the actual equation here. Uh, the KL divergence of distribution P and then distribution Q is basically the logs of the, the sum of the logs here. Here you go. Here's here's the full math equation that you need to do. And it's also not commutative, I think. It's like KL of P and Q is not the same as KL of Q and P. Uh, how one measure of how one probability distribution P is different from a second reference probability distribution Q. Yeah, and statistics people are, are kind of a sticklers. Like a lot of times they... Uh, they're quick to point out that it's not a metric and it's not a distance. And it's because it's not symmetric, right? The distance between P and Q and Q and P should be the same if this was a distance metric. But the KL divergence of P and Q is different from the KL divergence of Q and P, right? The order of, of operations here matters, which means that it's not a distance metric. But what you can do is you can say, okay, well, my big vision transformer model has some probability distribution in its outputs. And then these small little models that I'm making here have some probability distribution over their outputs. I want those two probability, probability distributions to match. And that's where they use the, they bring in the KL divergence as a loss to bring the students closer to the teacher. And the interesting thing here is that we achieve new state-of-the-art on the both VITB and VITL sizes, is that 
the previous state of the arts for VITB and VITL were probably on just generic pre-training, right? So like they basically just, they train the VITB on ImageNet and then what do you get, right? What is the performance? But if you take this VITB and instead of just training it directly on the data set, you, you basically use this, this distillation technique where you're training it to basically just mimic the large model, you actually get a state of the art, which is crazy to think about, right? Where it's like, it's better to train a small model to copy the big model than it is to just take the small model and train it from scratch on the data set. Okay, and that's it. Then we get to the conclusion here. We presented VIT22B, the currently largest vision transformer model at 22 billion parameters. We show that with small but critical changes to the original architecture, we can achieve both excellent hardware utilization and training stability. In particular, great performance can be achieved using frozen models to produce embeddings. I want this as an API. I want an API where I send Google an image and it gives me back a embedding that is the coming from VIT22B and then training thin layers on top. Our evaluations further show that VIT22B is more aligned with humans when it comes to shape and textures and offers benefits and fairness to robustness, fairness and robustness. Cool. So that was Vision Transformer. So here we go. We wanted to calculate the exact uh, cost of this, right? So 1024 TPU V4 chips for 177K steps. And what is the steps per second? Did they tell us that? Second. Per second. They don't want us to know, man. Out of distribution, head to toe, few shot. Clever patch. Details about hyperparameters, errors consistency, feature attribution. They're not going to tell us, guys. It's unfortunate. What is, how long does one step take in TPU? I mean, You is like some kind of 3D printing thing. Maybe they say it up here when they were talking about the actual distributed training. One point one five K tokens per second. How many tokens in one step?
Okay, here we go. VIT22B is trained for 177k steps with a batch size of 65k. So we have 177 177,000 steps. Each step is 65,000 tokens. Uh, each token, or then to go from, so we go from steps to tokens, and then we go from tokens to seconds. So 1.15k tokens per second. So uh, we divide by 1150. And that's the total number of seconds required for that many steps of that many tokens each. So, let's go back down to the, here where we highlighted, 1024 TPU V4 chips, so that many seconds, times 1024, so that's how many total seconds of individual TPU V4s. And then one TPU V4, uh, TPU V4 price, compute, cloud TPU pricing, one TPU V4 per hour is $3.22. So this is seconds. So let's divide by 60. Now it's minutes. Let's divide by 60 again. Now it's hours times 322. So this is $9 million of training. That's insane. So obviously this is all back of the envelope math. There is no way that it costs Google $3 for a TPU v4 because of obviously they make it themselves. So this is significantly lower. Um, this is also, we don't know exactly if the 177k steps are happening for every single uh, TPU, exactly what all of that is doing, but back of the envelope math, training this $22 billion vision transformer is a $9 million job. There you go, guys. That is, that is it, $9 million for one $22 billion boy, or 22 billion parameter boy. Um, cool, hope you guys found that interesting. Um, stay tuned next week. We're also going to be doing, uh, three streams.